Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clements, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thank you for joining us today for Energy Efficiency and Climate Justice, an in-depth discussion on environmental justice and the Biden administration's policy priorities in that area. I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Climate Action Campaign, for supporting today's conversations. The devastating effects of climate change, exposure to pollution, and lack of access to clean, affordable energy have created a lot of economic and health disparities across the country, particularly in black, brown, indigenous, and low-income communities. On its first day in office, President Biden laid out an ambitious agenda to address the climate crisis. On today's program, we're going to examine the administration's policy priorities around environmental justice and pollution-free energy infrastructure. We're going to explore how Americans can have access to clean air, water, and sustainable housing. And we're going to pose these questions and more to administration officials, advocates, and sustainable energy experts. Before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us, and I hope you do tweet us, at The Hill Events using the hashtag hashtag the Hill Climate. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program, so send them our way. And as with any live stream, I, lo I, I love and hate this part. You can push refresh if your page goes wonky and it will fix everything, just believe me. Now let's dive right in. Joining me to discuss how the administration is ushering in a clean energy revolution and bringing justice to communities subjected to environmental harm is Brenda Mallory, chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Brenda, it's really great to talk with you. Now, I have to say it's been some years since I've heard a lot of conversations at the same time where in the same sentence we're talking about justice and trying to you know get climate maybe you can help our viewers understand why the connection uh, of those two in a single sentence in a single mission is so important absolutely and first of all Steve thanks so much for inviting me to participate in this program uh, one of the things that's so exciting about President Biden's agenda is that he is for, you know, the, in, in really the first time bringing those issues together. He's established an agenda that has made its anchor pillars uh, around connecting climate and justice and jobs. And those three things run through everything that we're doing because, in fact, those three things are important for stabilizing the country and for making sure that we can move forward in, in an economy that, that works for everyone. How big a lift is it? You know, I just, you know, I'm going to name drop. This is D.C. We embrace that. But I ran into Ernie <laughs> Moniz, uh, our former energy secretary, and he's involved with something called the Energy Futures Initiative. He was on the street in Washington walking by. I said, you know, Mr. Secretary. And, and you know, he's out there and has been pushing, uh, even before the election of President Biden, an energy jobs coalition to say, look, at the retrofitting as we look at this, we can connect that, you know, important climate agenda to the fact that we're coming out of a pandemic, one of the biggest you know, uh, uh, economic shocks the country has had at the same time, and try and connect these equations. Is there any piece of this that you've been seeing that kind of follows some of that track of an energy jobs coalition, essentially? Well, I do think that there are a lot of great ideas that have been um, that have been shared uh, over the over the recent years that really recognize that it's important to be thinking about how we rebuild the economy in this country in a way that is going to benefit everyone. And the clean energy is so important, not just because of the climate challenge, but because it does pose the or present the opportunity for us to, to rebuild our manufacturing sector, sector and other areas of the economy in a way that will have a uh, stabilizing force, but also, you know, prepare us for the future. You know, one of the key initiatives um, that I think you have helped launch and the Biden, President Biden has helped launch, so we'll give him credit first, but I know that you've been pushing it, is the Justice 40 initiative. Can you share with us what the contours of that are? And, and, and can you share with us why it matters so much when it comes to putting this country back together again? Because one of the things I'm really worried about is the political toxicity in this country, getting people to care about each other, having empathy. And that may require us to know that there were a lot of people that were not benefiting from the way things were before. So tell us about uh, Justice 40. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, let me just say this is um, President Biden's agenda. And so there's there's no talking me talking about what I'm doing that's separate from him, to be clear. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the president through throughout the campaign and really in the first days of the administration established the Justice 40 initiative. And it's a, a reflection of a commitment to make sure that the uh, investments, federal investments in clean energy, 
and um, climate change related um, uh, programs and activities um, result in 40% of the overall benefits going to low income and uh, communities of color. And that is a direct result of recognizing that for so long, we have not provided or made sure that all communities have benefited from federal investments. And I think it's an, a step that uh, not only will address some of our climate issues, but it also helps to try to bring these communities that are definitely behind in many ways you know, forward in their ability to grow and um, to recover uh, from some of the legacy pollution that they're suffering. You know, one of the uh, topics that I discussed recently was in a program that was actually funded by the Environmental Defense Fund, and I interviewed Congresswoman Yvette Clark. And we were kind of looking at the trucking industry and what was happening as, you know, more uh, e-trucks are coming online. And as you begin looking at what needs to be retrofitted by way of charging stations and all of this, she is very committed to going into these same uh, neighborhoods that have been neglected and left on the sidelines of progress and saying we need to build that in. Now, I know that this is a small part of the bigger topic that you're talking about, but it seemed to me that that was, you know, on the mind and, and, and the sort of dashboards of other members of Congress as we sort of shape and sculpt what we're doing by way of energy efficiencies in the future and climate and trucking. Are you working with her? Is the White House hearing about these initiatives, about trying to marry, you know, our future energy development with um, community that have been neglected in the past? I, I think absolutely. I mean, we are in we are in contact with our allies on the Hill in a variety of different ways. And, um, you know, many of the ideas that are reflected in Justice 40 as an example, but in other parts of the agenda are ideas that have been percolating for several years and are coming from, as I said before, from a variety mm. of places. And so it, when you think about the Justice 40 initiative, which you know does a number of things, but is targeted on looking at things like lead in drinking water, looking at um, you know, establishing better um, energy efficiency in rural communities, looking at how you can um, impact some of the housing uh, problems that exist. Like all of these are programs that are within the 21 um, projects or programs that are set up for the first pilot in the Justice 40 uh, initiative. And they not only affect kind of energy and energy efficiency related things and other um, direct climate activities, but they also deal with these historic problems that have been uh, plaguing communities for so long. You know, one of the um, things I've been thinking about since the Biden administration came in is that we had four years of the Trump administration on, on a lot of these areas. I don't know how to politely call it. There was regression. <laughs> you know, some stuff went the other way. I mean, we'll just, you know, be frank about that. But if you looked at the towns and the states and you looked at red states, you looked at blue states, you looked at companies that were out there. I remember being in an international conference with former Mayor Mike Bloomberg, who said, you know, if the federal government is abdicating its responsibility, there are lots of other players that can play this. So I guess my question to you is, during a time when the kind of agenda that you have was not getting the attention and support uh, previous to the Biden administration, how um, resilient was the energy and climate justice picture nationally lower level in our nation? Does that make sense? Am I, am I communicating that well enough? Uh, I, I know what you're trying to get at. Why don't I start? And if I'm not actually uh, addressing it, then you can sort of steer me away. I mean, I, I think basically what I would say, and just as, uh, as um, Mr. Bloomberg said, I mean, one of the things that happened in the last four years is that you did see some states and some local communities really stepping up in recognition that they needed to fill that void, that they needed to not only, um, you know, step in where you would expect the federal government to be playing a, a role, but to do so in sort of in a progressive way that is actually moving the agenda forward so that when the feds came back that they could, you know, that they would have some additional progress to, to make up. And so I do believe that, um, you know, when you look across the country at some of the initiatives that were occurring in different places, that they showed sort of progress along issues that we are, we are now picking up both in terms of climate, but also in terms of ideas on, um, you know, uh, the Justice 40 being an example. I mean, that is a, that is an approach that uh, New York has, um, was, was 
you know, implementing in, mm. in its in its state. And there are many ideas that are sort of are relevant. It's not the same, but of course there's just there's some synergy there that I think um, um, enables us to sort of talk about it and think about it in a um, more um, developed way than if we were starting from scratch. That's amazing. We're, we're taking questions from our audience and we have one here for you uh, from Jody. Jody? Hi, my name is Jody London. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator in Contra Costa County in the San Francisco Bay Area. My question is, what is the administration doing to expand eligibility for weatherization and related programs? In our experience, expanding eligibility for weatherization and expanding the program requirements is an easy and effective way to reduce energy bills and improve health for people who are least able to participate otherwise in these programs. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I would say that, you know, as we are thinking about rolling out, you know, Justice 40, as well as just more broadly about how in each of the agencies through a whole of government approach that we are able to, you know, deliver on the full agenda of ensuring that we're uh, addressing the needs of uh, disadvantaged communities. We recognize that there are places in our programs where the barriers are uh, associated with the, the criteria or the implementation of criteria that give people access to some of the programs. So that's definitely an area where the, um, the agencies are looking at their programs and seeing what opportunities exist for some flexibility. Now, there are places where it's statutory. And so you, obviously you're going to have uh, you have more limits on what you can do there. But where it's not driven by statute, uh, we can more quickly um, address the things that are within the discretion of the agency. And for those things that are driven by statute, then it can go on the list of things that we need to put forward for Congress to address. Let me ask, you know, sneak one last final one in. Um you know, in years past, I have spent a lot of time with Anthony Fox, a former uh, transportation secretary, former mayor, and he kind of helped educate me and I think many Americans that many of our infrastructure decisions that we made in the past divided communities, um, were fundamentally racist, um, left people out of that equation, and we've got to address that and fix that. And I'm going to you know, ask you that as we think about this question of climate and justice, which also it means a lot of infrastructure and we're at an inflection point, I think, uh, in those discussions, can we undo a lot of that damage seriously in your gut? Or do you think this is, this is something that's going to take us you know, a lot more work and effort to get by? Well, I would say that, you know, it depends on the place, right? Now, the president has very specifically included within the uh, agenda the idea of trying to re undo and fix areas in which communities were harmed by the bisecting of, uh, you know, uh, uh, established communities. But I think whether it works and how it works will really depend on the locations. And so mm. I think there is a um, kind of an openness and, you know, a motivation to kind of look and examine and see what our opportunities are. But, you know, it will obviously depend on what the circumstances are on the ground, what the communities themselves at this point want, whether that's a value add or is at this point disruptive in and of itself. Uh, and I'm sure that that might be true in some cases, um, uh, as opposed to just assuming uh, that the, the right answer is to just undo something that was put in uh, place previously, that now people have already built up new, uh, both, you know, actual infrastructure, but also like community supportive, um, uh, you know, uh, structures around. Well, Brenda Mallory, chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, this was fun and illuminative. And I look forward to you coming back, if you will, and tell us how the Justice 40 uh, initiative is going down the road and, and looking at the impact that you're making uh, on the broad side of environmental quality and, and these very, very important justice issues. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me.